So the question really is, uh, what makes for an authentic Christian, or more particularly for us a uh, Catholic? Uh -huh. And, and uh, there, there have been a number of times when we've uh, used that, that term, descriptive term, for a Christian, for a Catholic, of authentic. So when you say that there are those who are authentic Christians, then there are also those who are not authentic. Either they are fake or uh, there is much that needs to be desired in their living out their Christian uh, faith. And then we have also talked about the lost sheep, where in the scriptures Jesus talk about the one out of the 100, and the, the man looked uh, for it, left the 99, looked for the one, and rejoice when he found it. And that, of course, is a parable on the mercy of God who wants no one to be, to be lost. But we've also been saying that, unfortunately, today, it is not the one that is lost. It is the 99. 99 of the 100 sheep are lost. So what we also want to look at when we talk about the authentic Christian the depth of faith, what would be the characteristics of the one percent? So we look at the 99, then we will look at uh, the one and what it should mean to have a uh, depth of uh, faith. And we see that if you're talking of 99 out of 100, there are many who fail to make the grade. And if talking about authenticity, uh, if that was a test, then many would flunk the test of authenticity. So we will look at those first of all, the, the 99. And as we are fond of uh, doing, we make use of acronyms. And so I will use the acronym uh, FLUNK, F-L-U-N-K. Uh, five aspects, characteristics of uh, lack of authentic faith. So, first of all, F, fleshly, of the flesh. Now, that is uh, today's reading, by the way, uh, from uh, the letter of Paul to the Galatians. And it talks about the flesh, about the spirit, how the two are opposed to each other. And of course, we are not to live according to the flesh, but we're uh, to live according to the, the spirit. There's always a tension between the, the flesh and the spirit. And that tension is, is the raging within us. And, and the flesh trying to bring us down uh, with the work of the evil one and the enticements of the world. But the spirit of Christ that is within us, uh, helping us. Trying, trying to keep us uh, on, on, on the right track. The Christian life that we're called to is a life in the spirit. And we take a look at what it says, what Paul says in Galatians 5, verse 16. I say then, live by the spirit, and you will certainly not gratify the desire of the flesh. And then he goes on to talk about the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, 19 to 21. And here he lists 15 works of the flesh. What are those? Immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, rivalry, jealousy, outbursts of fury, acts of selfishness, dissensions, factions, occasions of envy, envy drinking bouts, orgies. 15 works of the uh, flesh. And it's interesting to, to note that the first five and the last two have to do with immorality, impurity. impurity. Mm -hmm. While the eight other works of the flesh that is wedged between mm -hmm. the, the first five and the last two the, the acts of immorality and impurity has have to do with uh, relating to one another, with 
how uh, members of the body of Christ, as we all are, members of the church, and in particular MFC uh, or, or in the parish, how they are to relate to one another. And if they fall into these works of the flesh, what results is disunity. What results is strife and disorder in the body. And of course, the body of Christ is very, very crucial. It needs to be of one heart and of one mind, doing the one uh, mission uh, entrusted to, to her by, by Christ. And so this works of the flesh can really wreak havoc on the individual lives of Christians, but also on the body to which they, they belong. Now, unfortunately, there are many so-called Christians who engage in this works of the flesh. You, 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 you read through it, uh, you, you, you will know that that really is uh, the, the case. Uh, some of it perhaps uh, still in our own lives, but certainly we see in the lives of uh, others. And Paul makes this very, very dire warning in verse 21. He says, I warn you, as I warned you before, so it seems as if it's an ongoing thing. And, and really you can see from this words of the flesh, these are ongoing things. People might recognize it, they might repent of it, they might strive to turn over a new leaf, but then... Uh, people would fall into them uh, once again. And it is very, very great challenge. So here was Paul uh, talking to the Galatians, having warned them before and now warning them, them again. What does he say? But those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. that's, that's quite dire. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, when we talk of the uh, sense of immorality, impurity, licen licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery. Uh, we, we would readily say, yeah, uh, there, there is no place in the life of a Christian for those, uh, for those works. But then when we look at the others, rivalry, jealousy, uh, outbursts of fury, selfishness, dissensions, factions, when we might recognize that these things are wrong, but, you know, we, we, we might say, ah, that's not as serious as the sense of impurity, of, of idolatry. You know? and, and we might fall into that every now and then. Well, what Paul says, he lumps all of them together as the works of the flesh, and those who do such works will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, it's that serious. And so our response also needs to be, very, very serious. And that is we need to crucify our flesh. In verse 24, it says here, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. We nail these desires to the cross. And, and we, we desire to have nothing to do uh, with this. We, we give them up totally. We disdain them. We, we avoid them. And then, we are not just to crucify the flesh, because you're talking of the flesh and the spirit, so what you do with the works of the flesh, you crucify them, and, uh, uh, but then there is the positive aspects of the spirit, so what you do is you live in the spirit. And in verse 25, Paul says, if we live in the spirit, let us also follow the spirit. Jesus sent us his spirit to guide us, to instruct us, to remind us of the words of Jesus, to show us uh, the way, to uh, strengthen us, to empower us, to defend us. So all, all of these works of the Spirit are very crucial to the Christian life. And when we live in the Spirit, then we can expect to be able to avoid the works of the flesh and to manifest fruit in our life. And Paul talks about that also in verses 22 to 23. He says, uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. Now one thing that's interesting here, Paul does not say the fruits of the Spirit. He says the fruit, the one fruit 
if you are a Christian, then you bear this one fruit with many, many aspects, many uh, elements, virtues, uh, ways of living that are part of the one fruit. In other words, we, we cannot just say that, well, okay, uh, uh, patience for me is, is good, but uh, gentleness, maybe I have a greater difficulty with that. No, we need to strive in all of these aspects so that we produce that one fruit of the Spirit. And then uh, in verse 26, Paul continues to say, he says, let us not be conceited, provoking one another, envious of one another. Now, think about those three things within the context of uh, the life of the community, in our relationship with brothers and sisters uh, in the Lord. Because these three aspects in particular are the key for peace in the community, for good order, for uh, unity. All the aspects that can keep us together, keep us as one, as authentic brothers and sisters in Him, as uh, uh, fellow servants, as co-workers for the kingdom. These are all very, very uh, crucial. If we're not conceited, we humble ourselves. Then we, we don't stand on, on our rights, our accomplishments, our thinking that uh, we're better than the other person, you know, or we have a, a better position. So we, we are not conceited. You might have the position, you might have the gift, but we all take that in humility that God would use someone like me and afford me uh, all those wonderful things by which I can really serve him. Then we don't provoke one another. No. We, we try to live in peace with one another. There will be disagreements. Uh, we might rub each other the wrong way, but we are patient, that we are understanding, we are tolerant, and we are forgiving whenever need be. We don't, we don't provoke, we don't, uh, we don't light the fire uh, that, that is starting to flicker. Uh, we don't uh, worsen a situation where uh, there is that, that uh, uh, dissent. Uh, with, uh, uh, between or among uh, persons. And then we are not envious of one another. No. We are all part of the one body. Whatever happens, no. when the body is doing well, we all should rejoice. When the body is not doing well, then we can be sad and we can strive harder. But if it's the other uh, brother who is doing well and we're not doing so well in the same uh, in similar service, then still, we are part of that one body. What happens to one happens to all of us. And so we're all invested together in that. Okay, so the, the first aspect by which one flunks the test of authenticity in the Christian life is one, when one is fleshly, uh, of the flesh. Now let's move on to the second, and that is L. That stands for lapsed Catholics. No. Lapsed Catholics. What does lapse mean? No. When, when your driver's license uh, lapses, no. uh, when your uh, credit card uh, expires. So what does, what does lapse mean? It means expired. It means voided. It means uh, terminated. So a lapsed Catholic is no longer active or practicing uh, the faith. Uh, he is not living as a Catholic. And if you're not living as a Catholic, then you're not living as a Christian. No. The faith has lapsed you by. No. You, you have set it aside. You are not uh, living it. Now, there are various degrees of being a lapsed Catholic. So when we talk of the 99, there are different degrees. And I'll speak in general, it obviously will not be the case in every country or even in every uh, territorial area, uh, it would differ. But, but this will give us a good idea. When we talk about 
the 99 lost sheep. Who are those 99? In what way are they lost? So, first you have 50%. Half of them, laps Catholics, who are nominal, name only, and who are secular. So very much of the world. They are really uh, living a life outside of Christ. So they are not Christian at all. So they might be into serious sin. They might be uh, living uh, in, in the darkness of the dominion of the uh, evil one. Uh, or they might simply have nothing to do with faith, with religion, with, with God. So a good number of, of, of Christians, half are nominal and secular, not spiritual. And then you have one fourth, 25%, who we might say are basically good people, but their faith is separate, uh, separate from their uh, secular lives. So there, there is a dichotomy. Here is my life of faith. I try to act spiritual, but then here is my uh, secular life, my life in the world. So that really does not have that much space for, for the spiritual. So these Catholics might go to Mass now and then, but they don't see it as a regular obligation, weekly obligation. Maybe to be done when it's a special occasion, birthday anniversary, or, or Advent, or, or Lent, but not regularly. And then the rest of the week, they might engage in things not pleasing to God. It, it might be uh, some of the things that are were described by Paul as uh, the words of the, of the flesh, hatred of other people, jealousy, being jealous of, of others. Uh, unrighteous anger, envy. So it might be those things uh, that are not pleasing uh, to God. And then you have 15% who, let's say, are regular churchgoers. Every week they go to church. But basically they still have their own priorities, agenda, uh, desires. They have not turned their life over completely to Jesus. So Jesus says it's time one hour on Sunday, once a week, and then maybe they, they also have their, their prayer time, but here is a time that I allocate to Jesus, the rest of the time is mine. Now, uh, I'm not saying that necessarily they are doing bad things. But uh, they call the call to a Christian, to an authentic Christian, is to be totally committed to God, to turn our life over completely uh, to Jesus you know, and let him run our lives. You know. So he, Jesus is not just there sometimes, even regularly, but he needs to be there all the time. We live our lives 24-7 for uh, Jesus. Now then, another degree, you have 9% who are good Christians, let's say, but might not be striving for holiness or engage in the work of the kingdom. And basically, that is the work of uh, evangelization. So you need, even, even for many of us, uh, if, if, if you were living, you might say fairly good Christian, before taking care of your family, uh, going to church uh, weekly, uh, praying. But perhaps there was no thought, no knowledge, no striving for holiness. That we are called not just to be a good Christian, but a holy Christian, to be like Christ, to be another Christ. In fact, to be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. And then for many lay Catholics, there is no thought or conception of the call to proclaim the gospel, which is the most fundamental call for a Christian, which is the final instructions of Jesus before he ascended to heaven. 
This is the Great Commission. This is the continuation of the very work of uh, Jesus in the world uh, in order to help bring uh, many more souls into the kingdom, which was why the Father sent His Son into the world in the very first place. So many are not engaged in that. And if, if we are not engaged in that, we still fall short. What is the definition of sin? It is falling short. So when there is the, the bar that uh, God gives to us and we fall short of that, then that is what, uh, how you can describe sin. Of course, if you're up there, you're not quite uh, at, at, at the ideal, but near to it, then you, you commit uh, small sins still. But there are many who are way, way down and they can commit very grave sins. So that makes up 99%. And the one, uh, we will talk about that them a uh, uh, little bit more uh, later. So they are those whom we would say are living an authentic Christian or Catholic faith. So if it's 1%, that is a small flaw. And unfortunately, that is the reality today. In the church, in a world where there are Two billion Christians, half of them, one billion Catholics. It's really just one percent who are living the fullness of the authentic Christian uh, faith, who have that depth of, of, of faith. So there are very many uh, lapsed Catholics. That's L. Moving on to the third uh, aspect of those who flunk the test of authenticity, who fail to make the grade, you, F-L-U. These are, this is unknowing. So, unknowing Catholics. What does that mean? They are basically clueless as to what is the authentic faith. And they, well, they, they, they lack formation. And, you know, even, even like in the Philippines and other many Western Christian nations, they're, they are Christian, they are Catholic, but uh, many, many of the Christians, the Catholics, again, are not living out the authentic uh, Christian faith because they lack formation. They might have been born in a Catholic family and went to a Catholic school and their, their peers, their, their friends, their relatives, their home is uh, uh, Christian, but they don't really know the essence of the faith. Now, what do I mean? Okay, the, the most important aspects of the Christian faith. First of all, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We are supposed to live a Christ-centered life. But there are many who know about Jesus but they don't know Jesus. They don't have a personal relationship. They don't have a deep, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus. But that's the only kind of relationship that one needs to have. Yeah. Where Jesus is uh, the very essence of our uh, lives. Where, you know, if we want to be founded on rock, we listen to and act on the words of, of Jesus. And that means to say, we, we need to know him. We need to know what he teaches. We need to, to know how, how, we, how we ask what he, his instructions are. You know? And, and he's, he's called to holiness. He's called to Christian perfection. But you and I know that there are many who are totally unaware of, of uh, that aspect of the Christian faith. Aspect of the Bible. And among Christian denominations, it has been said, and I think rightly so, that Catholics are uh, the least into the Bible. All our homes have Bibles, but they are, are not really read. Now, St. Jerome said, ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. So how will you know about Jesus if you don't read, if you don't study, if you don't meditate on the very words of God? How will you know the instructions beyond the words of Jesus, but uh, the fullness of the faith, including what is in the Old Testament throughout salvation history, unless you read the Bible. 
And the Bible is our instruction uh, book. And very, very essential, very, very uh, critical. Uh, but again, unfortunately, many Catholics do not know the Bible. They do not read the Bible, much less uh, meditate and, and try to apply uh, biblical principles to their day-to-day -day, uh, lives. So they are unknowing. Ignorance, ignorance of Christ. And then, there is that very important person in our lives, Mama Mary. And, and now, in, in the case of Mama Mary, uh, there are many, many Catholics, especially in places like the Philippines, where they have a Marian devotion. So they're very much devoted to, to Mary. They pray the rosary. They, go, they do novenas. They go on, on Marian possessions. And that's, that's a good thing. But there is so much more. And this is precisely what we've been learning uh, here in, in MFC about uh, Mary her role in spiritual war. So oftentimes the concept of Mary, well, she's our sweet mother. No? So, so uh, demure and, and quiet, actually serene, no? a very good person, but it's not really all that outgoing. No? Well, there's not so much that she does and says that it's recorded in the Bible. But what we learn about her is that she is very much engaged in spiritual war. From uh, the, the, the very time when, when war broke out in heaven and Lucifer was thrown out, defeated by Michael and Lucifer became Satan and uh, the, the dragon, the ancient serpent, was trying to devour the, the child born of the mother. And that talks to us about Mary and her son that is right there in the midst of spiritual war and engaged in that. And the ancient serpent, the dragon, trying to devour the child, to destroy the child. And of course, in the case of uh, Adam and Eve, our first parents, uh, they, they fell due to the temptation of the serpent. And when God called the protagonists together in the Garden of uh, Eden, uh, he was addressing the serpent and says, I, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And we understand the woman to be Mary. I mean, it's a prophetic uh, pronouncement that gave hope. They were going to lose it all. They were going to be sent out of Eden. But there was hope because there is the promise of a savior. And the woman is Mary. She is the new Eve. And her offspring is uh, Jesus, who is the new Adam. And together, they crush the head of the serpent. So this is very, very uh, important. And, and uh, many Catholics uh, are not aware of that. But but that is so very crucial to know, so that even in our prayers, even when we make use of the rosary, that, that we see that this is a spiritual weapon, precisely to be used against the evil one in the spiritual world that we are engaged. And, and we, we in MFC, we call ourselves the Army of Mary. And of course we are the Army of Christ, but the two are together. There is no tension or conflict between them. They are the dynamic duo. You know? They're, they're a, a, the, 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 the pair the, uh, with Jesus as the uh, Redeemer, the one Redeemer of the world, and Mary as his co tricks. So this is important to know. And even in our devotion to Mary, that we see her uh, engaged as we are, as we all are engaged also with us in spiritual warfare. So that's why we have consecrated ourselves to uh, Mary. You know? And then we say that we are uh, her uh, holy warriors. So Mary, many are unknowing of that aspect of, of Mary. Uh, what else? What else are many Catholics unknowing of? The sacraments. They might know that there are uh, seven sacraments. You know? 
uh, of course, they baptize as infants, they're confirmed as a young person, uh, then they get married, many, many, many get married without really uh, understanding what this uh, sacrament is about. They, they get a uh, brief, uh, quickie uh, instruction, uh, but uh, they don't really know. Well, anyway, you, you really learn it as you go through marriage itself. But the uh, two sacraments that are regularly available to us uh, would be uh, the Eucharist and reconciliation. And the Eucharist is supposed to go to Mass, receive Holy Communion. Well, go to Mass every, every week, receive Holy Communion. Uh, what is it? Is it uh, at least once a year? But for us, if you go to Mass, you should receive Holy Communion. Why would you not receive Holy Communion? And if you're in great sin, then you confess. And even as you go to Mass, you're there in the presence of the holiness of God with Mama Mary, the angels and saints. It's a, it's a holy coming together, commemorating the uh, passion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a very holy event. And that is so crucial. And we need to understand what really happens. Uh, there's so much that happens in, in the Eucharistic celebration. Uh, I've spoken at length about that in one of the podcasts as well. And uh, I, I said that it's like a uh, school of formation that we go to each and every week where Jesus is the teacher. And he reminds us of all the things that uh, we need to be doing. Uh, and if we don't, then we're returning once again and reminded once again. And if that happens each and every week, you know, you'd be a hypocrite if you didn't really strive to overcome uh, uh, the, the aspects of life where we lack uh, in the Lord you know, and to try to become the persons that God, Jesus, really intends all of us to, to become. So the sacraments are very, very crucial. They're part of our uh, spiritual uh, equipment. You know? they, they strengthen us for the work that is there. And then just one more, there, there would be many others, but talking about uh, Catholic series and no way, there is the church. Now Catholics know, yes, there is the church. And some of them might think in terms of church, the parish church where they go to, but there is the church, the one body of Christ on earth, that we are all brothers and sisters to one another, that that Jesus instituted this church in order to uh, continue to do his work on earth until he returns once again. And as a church, as the body of Christians, we are supposed to be light to the world. We're so, supposed to be leaven. And this church is supposed to be missionary. How many Catholics really understand all of those? Many of them are, are unknowing that uh, Jesus did institute, uh, did set up uh, a, a, a body, a, a church uh, founded on the rock that is Peter. Of course, rock with a, capi with a capital R is used himself. And that this uh, church is the, the body by which uh, his will, God's will, is continued to be done in the world. And a big aspect of that God's will is, again, being missionary. The church is missionary. Many have forgotten that. Unfortunately, even among the clergy and the prelates, they're engaged in so many, many different things, including social justice issues, but are not so much anymore into the proclamation of the of the gospel of salvation in Jesus into uh, actually making disciples of all the nations. But that is a critical work of the church. So you is unknowing. And an unknowing Christian or Catholic is uh, someone who uh, plunks the test of authenticity of faith. Okay, let's move on to the fourth, and that's N, neo-modernist. 
Now that's actually the same as modernist. We've, we've been speaking many times about modernism, but modernism rears its ugly head every now and then throughout salvation uh, history, throughout the two millennia. So, uh, so today we're seeing modernism once again, and you can call it neo-modernism, just like new evangelization. Evangelization is evangelization. But during these times, uh, the Holy Spirit is calling for a new evangelization, a neo-evangelization. So, neo-modernism. Uh, and Paul the 10th said that modernism is the synthesis of all heresies, heresies against the faith, all the things that go against the faith that are, that are wrong, the, the synthesis, the, the, the summary, the putting together of all of those heresies is uh, modernism. And what basically does modernism mean? Well, uh, modernism, by, by its name, seeks to modernize the church, seeks to modernize beliefs in uh, the church or, or of the church. And modernize means making up to date. You know? And basically what that means is, is conforming it to the spirit of the age, to the zeke guys. So there is that, that particular culture, that particular spirit that, that animates a particular age, a pe particular period uh, in historic time. And modernism says, the church needs to conform. No. You need to modernize. No, you, you, you cannot just uh, remain with your uh, tradition and age old teachings. In fact, modernism says that there's no such thing as, as uh, unchangeable, no. as, as permanent. No. So you, you, you shouldn't be able to say, oh, this is how we've been doing things, this is how the church has, has taught. Uh, this uh, traditional teaching of the church. No, modernism says it can be changed. It should be changed. It must conform to what is uh, of, of today. And basically, why, why it's wrong is because it focuses on the well-being of man rather than the righteousness of God. So the focus is man rather than, than God. It's 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 uh, it's uh, the age of the uh, heresy, even part of the uh, sin of Adam and Eve, Eve no? where uh, the, the, their pride was stoked by uh, the serpent, and so they disobeyed. But it is also looking to themselves. The devil told them, you can be like gods. Oh, I can be like God? So suddenly it wasn't enough that they already were walking with God. That they had access to God, that they had everything that they ever need. They lived a perfect existence. They were perfect, but that wasn't enough. Now they wanted to be God. So modernism, the focus is on man and not on the righteousness of God. That might still be there. So depending on the degree of uh, modernism, uh, at times uh, God might still be there in the peripheries. But uh, the the well-being of uh, the human being is given primary uh, consideration versus the righteousness of, of, of God. Now, when we talk of modernism, uh, there are many different isms that you, you can love them all and say modernism, though actually on their own, they uh, can stand. You know? So I'd like to take a look at a few of these. We've seen a number of them before, but it's always worth getting into them. Because again, uh, there are many Catholics today who are unaware. They don't know uh, what is really going on in the, in the world around them. So, what are some of these uh, other isms that are part of modernism? Well, first is secular humanism. That basically looks to uh, human reason. Uh, it, it rejects uh, faith and religious doctrine. Because uh, faith is uh, belief in what is not seen. If you can see it, that's no longer faith. So faith is in what is unseen. I, I believe in it because God says so, 
and that is faith. But but secular reminiscence, no, look to human reason. If my human reason cannot explain, cannot understand, then I can uh, reject it. And that would go with much of religious doctrine. Because, because uh, religion, that is uh, otherworldly. Uh, it, it is often not, not what one can, can see, can feel, can actually experience in day-to-day -day, uh, existence. So there is the secular versus the religious or spiritual worldview. And again, this is man versus, versus God. Because it's a rejection of the supernatural. And, and the mysteries of God uh, cannot be grasped by the ordinary human mind. They have to be taken on, on, on faith. But this is what secular humanism rejects. Now, many bad things have come because of this. And one, one is, uh, of course, the uh, sexual uh, revolution. revolution because okay, the church says that uh, unless the act of uh, sex is within the context of marriage, sacramental marriage, then it would be wrong. Two people not uh, married to one another or, or uh, two persons of the same sex. But then if that is being rejected, you know, okay, that's what the Bible says. But this is not about the Bible. The, the, the secular humanist might say this is about how we see things. And so we reject that. And so you have the sexual revolution, which is really devastated uh, lives, marriages, uh, families, stability of society. Now, one other ism is relativism. And there are a number of similarities with all of these isms. But relativism uh, basically says there's no objective or absolute absolute truth. But what we consider true would vary according to the circumstance or how we, we see things. And so uh, moral principles, if you want to talk about moral principles, must be based on culture and subject to individual choice. So it's, it's relative. What is good for me is not necessarily good for you and, and vice versa. Uh, maybe a quick example. Uh, let's say uh, uh, headhunters in, in a tribe in uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, for example. So uh, killing and, and cutting off head would be objectively wrong for us uh, in, in our faith. But there are those who would say, well, well, no, that, that's all they know. That is actually their culture. In fact, it's a mark of whatever, uh, honor, uh, manhood. If you are able to kill an enemy and, uh, uh, and cut off uh, that, that person's uh, head. So it's acceptable. It's permissible. We don't judge it. Or, uh, this we have experienced uh, in our missions, polygamy in Africa. Because in many places, traditionally, they have accepted polygamy. And so when Christianity came and uh, 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 the, the Africans became Christians, became Catholics, now it clashed with the teaching on one man, one woman in, in marriage. And polygamy is not acceptable. And so we even, in our mission uh, there, we, we even could see uh, priests and some bishops saying, uh, tread lightly, you know, because this is such a deep uh, culture in the society. It is accepted. So some of them turn the blind eye. And, and of course, for, for Christians, for Catholics, uh, no, that is not acceptable. Polygamy is not acceptable uh, in any culture, in any day, in any, in any age. But again, uh, for the uh, relativists, it is relative. It is, it is not uh, about absolute uh, truth or moral principles, but what is acceptable to a particular uh, culture. So in, in that case, all points of view are valid because all truth is relative to the individual. 
So that's why even in today's society, you see moral confusion. Because of this, this kind of thinking. Who are you to judge me? Uh, who are you to tell me what is right and, and just? I decide that for myself. So obviously it cannot be. And the result of that is great uh, confusion, as really there is in the, in the world and even in the church today. Uh, just one more ism, uh, Marxism. Uh, well, uh, just just uh, basically, uh, Marxism is uh, about the overthrow of outdated class structures. Orthodoxy has been, and so this needs to be overthrown. Uh, Open times it can only happen with with force, and the end is having a so-called classless society. No elites, no rich, no poor, uh, all all the same. In places like China, they even dressed uh, uh, similarly before in the black uh, Mao uh, suit or jacket. So, classless society. And the, there would be state control over the means of uh, production. So, there would be no economic, economic freedom, but uh, the state controls uh, everything. Now, supposedly, Marxism is for the people, and it talks a good talk. If you don't understand, ah, yes, that should be right. There should be justice for all. There should be equal access to, to everyone. Everyone should have a fair share of the world's goods. And a number of those things are actually Christian principles, you know, uh, supposedly for the people, but it never ends that way. The rule is always uh, done by, by the, a totalitarian elite who are above everyone else. They prefer, they profess to work for uh, the people, but they actually are the elite and they end up abusing the, the people. And you see many examples of this in uh, throughout history. Uh, China before under Mao Zedong, or uh, the Soviet Union under Stalin, or how uh, uh, liberation theology was uh, being uh, practiced in Latin America, or even today, the United States, the Black Lives Matter uh, ideology or, or movement. You know? So all of them claim you know, this is uh, for the people and everyone should be equal. There should be no uh, injustice, whether racial injustice or economic injustice, but it never really turns out that way. And there's a lot of violence, a lot of people get, get killed and at the end of that, there is still uh, totalitarianism. Okay, so neo-modernism. Uh, there, there are uh, still many Christians, Catholics, who fall into these different uh, isms. And so they fall short of the authenticity of uh, the Christian faith. Okay, let me get to the, to the fifth. And this is the culture of uh, death. Now, uh, okay, you, you see there that I, I spell the uh, culture not with a C, but with a K. Uh, why? Well, because it would not uh, fit my narrative, <laughs> F, L, U, and K, if I use a C. No, uh, uh, seriously, that, that's quite a stretch, but, but I, I looked it up in the internet, in Wikipedia, and uh, it is acceptable to, to many today. And to me, actually, it's a little bit silly, uh, even stupid, but that's the culture of today. It's a so-called woke culture. So we might as well uh, make use of that. <laughs> so so the, the, the fifth, element or aspect is the culture of death. Excuse me, I lost my video. Uh, Joshua, can you try to see how I can gain my video? So the, the culture of, of death, you know, and uh, well, death, as you know, we've spoken about this a number of times, is an acronym, the ATH, uh, which stands for uh, divorce, euthanasia, abortion, 
uh, total population control, and homosexual uh, relationships. Now, many Christians, many Catholics are into those things. For, for you and I, we might say uh, that, that that's terrible. No? That can never be accepted. But there are very many Christians and Catholics who are engaged in these elements of this uh, culture of, of, of death. Even uh, uh, in contemporary times, you look at the uh, U.S. election. Uh, great excitement is uh, coming very soon. Uh, it can uh, affect uh, not just the United States, but the, 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 the whole world, whatever is the outcome of that uh, election. But there are politicians there who claim to be devout Catholics, but are rapidly and aggressively for abortion without any limit even up to just the moment before the child comes out and now in some cases even as the child has come out they can still kill the child that's no longer technically abortion that's infanticide but that is where it has it has gone uh, to no? this is the the culture of death that is deeply entrenched and, and again, it's not just people uh, engaged in that. There are many sinners in the world. But these are people who claim to be devout, who insist on receiving Holy Communion, who speak about their faith. And unfortunately, they're not really called out by, by uh, some clerics or prelates. Joshua, can you look at my screen? Yeah. So then there are, uh, okay, culture of death, so uh, ho 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 homosexuality, for example. Uh, thank you, son. Uh, homosexuality. Now, gays, uh, if you are not actively into homosexual uh, relations, you can be a good Christian. You can be an exemplary Catholic. You, you can have that uh, tendency or that, that uh, uh, attraction. It's a disordered attraction, but you know, it, it's there. But you can resist it and you can live a chaste life. But what is not acceptable is to be a supporter of LGBT because it is an ideology that is anti-Christian. It is totally against the precepts of God. It is totally contrary to the way that God designed uh, 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 things, uh, as, as we see in the very first book of the Bible, the, the book of Genesis, chapter 1. It is not in accordance with the Christian faith. It is totally contrary. It seeks to destroy that Christian faith. It goes against the very uh, tenets of, of, of God. So, when we talk about the culture of, of death, uh, you're talking about going totally against the righteousness of God. And it simply is not acceptable. And one who engages in any way in the culture of death, embraces the culture of death, is failing uh, so much, is plunking the test of authenticity. So any of these above, F, L, U, and K, you plan the test of uh, an authentic Catholic. But again, our call is not just to be a nominal Catholic. We are not Catholic by name. No. We ought to be authentic Catholics. And what that means is we need death. If not, if there is no death, we certainly will go astray, as, as we have already seen. We, we will go astray. Consider the parable of the sower. So the, the sower sowed the seed, and some fell on, uh, along the path, and some on rocky ground, and some among thorns. And of course, there was some that fell on, on good soil. Uh, but when Jesus talks about the rocky ground in Mark 4, verse uh, 5, uh, he says there that uh, it had no depth 
of soil. It was not deep. It had no depth of soil. So what happened was when, when the sun rose, uh, it scorched the, the earth and uh, what, what sprouted out of that seed quickly withered. It, it, it died. So there is a need for depth of soil, for the faith to be planted, for the word of God to be planted and for it to, to bear uh, fruit no. and, and to, to blossom. And when we talk about faith, it, it really is not about man's wisdom, but, but God's, as we, as we have seen. And what does Paul say in Romans 11, verse 33? He says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How inscrutable are his judgments and how unsearchable his ways. The ways of God are deep. The judgments of God are inscrutable, are mysterious. And we need to plunge into the, the depth of the riches and wisdom of, and, and knowledge of God. That is how we discover what it means to be an authentic uh, Christian. So we're talking about true wisdom. And true wisdom is God's wisdom. But if it's so deep, if it's so mysterious, how will we know? Well, that's where the Holy Spirit helps us, the very Spirit of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10, Paul says, This God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit scrutinizes everything, even the depths of God. So, getting into the depth, the depths of God is important. We need depths in our Christian, Christian life. So now we look at aspects, again, not seen in the lives of many uh, Catholics. What, what, what are the aspects, elements that are needed for death? And again, we use death as an acronym, D-E-P-T-H, to look at uh, five uh, aspects. The first D is discipleship. We are disciples of Christ. When we are baptized, we are cleansed of original sin, and we become a Christian by virtue of baptism. Then we are confirmed as a, a young person, and we're supposed to be a soldier of Christ. And and but but for many, it, it just escapes them. They they grow up through life, uh, not realizing what really has happened uh, to them, and so they don't really grow to be a follower of Christ. Baptized, confirmed, but not disciple. Not understanding what discipleship really means. What does discipleship mean? Where it is a follower of Christ. And, and that means, first of all, you, you leave the, the uh, two greatest commandments. You love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. You love your neighbors yourself. Uh, it, it means that you are founded on the rock that is Christ. You listen to Jesus' words and you act on them. And uh, as we read in the reading today from Galatians 5, 22 to 23, you display the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We display this as the fruit of the Spirit. But then there are lesser known aspects. Maybe people read it when they read the Bible, but it passes them by because it's not very attractive to them and they'd rather not uh, confront it, the reality of what it means to be a disciple. But uh, many ways that you can define discipleship, but Jesus himself gave one definition in Luke 9 verse 23. Uh, he said, if anyone wishes to come after me, uh, he must uh, deny himself and embrace his cross, take up his cross daily and follow me. Uh, three aspects that are important there. Self-denial, embrace of the cross, following Jesus. So how many Christians are really into self-denial? For most Christians, even the good ones, well, they're out there looking for themselves. Not necessarily going to do wrong things, but, you know, uh, what is important is uh, my, my well-being, my, my happiness, you know? my uh, security. 
but it cannot be for a disciple. It is up to the master to look into that for you, not for you to be the one to seek it out. Because the call to a disciple, the definition of being a disciple, is turning my life over to the master to do it as he sees fit. Not my preference, not my agenda, not my priorities, not my desires, but uh, the master's. And then there's embrace of the cross. People do not want the cross. They disdain the cross. They, they do not like suffering and pain in life. They look to comfort. They look to convenience. But uh, the cross is a crucial aspect of our life of faith. The cross is so central. It's there. Jesus Christ was crucified in the crucifix. And, and the, the way by which God won for us our salvation is Jesus dying on the cross. So this is very, very uh, important. And the cross actually uh, 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 allows us to enter uh, deeply into the very life of Christ to appreciate what he has gone through. No? Certainly we don't suffer that much as he did, but when we do and we offer this up to, to God and we put our faith and trust in him, then we are participating in that cross. We are embracing that cross and that's crucial. And then we follow Jesus. That means we obey him. That means we, we uh, do what he, whatever he wants us uh, to do. That means we go wherever he goes. You know? We might not know where. We might not know how things will be. We might not know what the provisions are. But we know that he is calling us or telling us to go. And so we just go. We obey him in every way. So, discipleship. A, a, the, the, uh, the death of our faith, uh, one crucial aspect is discipleship. Then we move to the second, and that's E, evangelical. Now, I don't know why the word evangelical has been co-opted by the evangelicals, you know, our Protestant uh, brethren, and when you talk of evangelical today, that's what we think of the evangelicals. Uh, uh, but, but evangelical is, is a very Christian word. It ought to be a very, very Catholic word. You know? And evangelical comes from the Greek evangelion, which means gospel. You know? The evangel, you know? the, the gospel, the good news of salvation in Jesus. And we are supposed to be committed to the Christian gospel message of Jesus as Savior and Lord. Now we see the so-called evangelicals, they are. They're very aggressive. In fact, while Catholics are nowhere to be found and not very aggressive, private in our faith, just going to church, if you're still going to church, but to go out there, and proclaim the, the gospel aggressively. That's what the evangelicals do. No, that's what we should do because we ought to be evangelical as well. The evangelicals look to, uh, to revival. They, they have an emphasis on converting outsiders, even Catholics, because they think that Catholics are not Christians. So the, the evangelical uh, looks for an opportunity to convert us to evangelicalism. But uh, that is what we as Catholics should do, to look to revival, uh, renewal of our lives, of our families, of society, re renewal and revival within the church, seeking to convert uh, others to the, to the faith, to make disciples of all the nations. That proselytism, to seek conversion, you know, to, to become uh, Catholic, you know, to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's what evangelical uh, means. And we are supposed to be evangelical. Then you know that uh, others are, other evangelicals are called born again. So you, you also see that all those born again Christians, you know, uh, and, and uh, the born again, so-called born again Christians, you know, and they ask a Catholic, are you born again? <laughs> and, and we're flustered, <laughs> don't know what to answer. Uh, of course, yes, we are born again. We are renewed from, from above. We, we have experienced uh, conversion, metanoia. We have repented of sin. We have turned to Jesus as, as our Lord. But there are also aspects of the born again that uh, 
uh, ought to be normative for uh, the Catholic. For example, the Bible. We, all, uh, we already mentioned the, the Bible. But the, the evangelicals are born again. There's so much into the Bible. We Catholics are not. It cannot be that way. Because we will remain uninformed. We will be ignorant. Uh, not just of scripture, but we'll be ignorant of, of Christ. You know? And then there ought to be a focus on uh, the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross and its saving effects. Yeah. How often do you actually hear Catholics, lay leaders, or uh, clerics talking about uh, this, this, this salvation and explaining the salvation one when Jesus on the cross for each and every one uh, of us? But this is crucial. This is the fundamental basic message. This is what we, we ought to, to proclaim because people need to hear that. Faith comes from hearing and people need co conversion. So we, we have to do as the born again uh, Christians do. And, and it is very Catholic when we, when we do that. It, it's it's uh, unfortunate that, that uh, Catholics uh, do not know so much that needs to be known. Uh, the essential aspects of, of the faith that one needs to be renewed, one needs to be born again or uh, renewed from above. That one uh, needs to delve into the Word of God, to devour the Word of God each and every day and make the Word of God uh, a, a part of our lives to, to live the Word. No? that one needs to look to the cross of Christ as we spoke about uh, earlier the authentic uh, faith is, is about the, the cross of Christ the authentic gospel is the gospel of, of the cross that one needs to do the work of evangelization of, of mission to proclaim the gospel and make disciples of all the nations so brothers and sisters this, this is what it means to be evangelical and Catholics are, or are supposed to be, uh, evangelical. And if we are not, we are missing out on the death of the authentic uh, Christian faith. Let's move on to the third, D-E-P, so P. Now this is another word that has been co-opted by our Protestant brethren. P, Pentecostal. And, and if you... Uh, talk Pentecostal today. Ah, you mean those Pentecostals? Or uh, what are you now? You're speaking in tongues. You, have you become Pentecostal? Okay. Pentecostal refers to Pentecost. That major event in the life of the church when the Holy Spirit came down upon the disciples and, and, and they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied and they worshiped God. And from that time in uh, Jerusalem, in that upper room, they went out and, and uh, evangelized so many, did uh, rapid, massive evangelization, and then went to the known ends of the earth at that time. And of course, today, the, throughout the, the whole uh, world. Why, why will we allow our Protestant brethren to co opt the term evangelic, uh, uh, Pentecostal? We are Pentecostal. We are a people of uh, Pentecost. No? And, and we, we, we value so much that, that, whole, uh, that, whole, that whole great event. When Jesus had said to his disciples, you, 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 you go to the upper room in Jerusalem and you wait for the promise of the Father. And it actually happened. The descent of the Holy Spirit. So... Uh, there are a number of uh, things that Pentecostals um, adhere to or, or believe in that we as Pentecostal also uh, have to have the same. You know? And it's again unfortunate that uh, those Pentecostals have these things, but many Catholics uh, do not. What are those? Well, that we have a personal relationship with Jesus. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. He's not just some part of God that we somehow relate to, but He is alive. He is there uh, for us. 
we, we trust in Him. We put our whole faith in Him. We hope uh, in Him. Uh, he, he animates each and every day of our lives. We are 24-7 for, for Jesus. Then we believe in the inerrancy of, of, the, of the Bible. You know, the, the Pentecostals so much into the Word of God. But Catholics are not. Again, we don't know the Word of God. And, and we, we uh, unless uh, you have the, uh, some of the theologians and philosophers and maybe in uh, seminaries, but for the greater majority of the people of God, the laity, they simply are not aware. But we, we need to be. This is part and parcel of, of uh, the authentic Christian life. Now, a key when you talk about Pentecost is the so-called baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, even there, there, there can be a conflict or a tension with, with uh, some other Catholics, uh, with clerics. Uh, they, when, you talk, when we talk about uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit in the way that we understand it, uh, they will always say, uh, oh, there's only one baptism in the Spirit. It happened in the sacrament of baptism. And while that's true, in the sacrament of baptism, we are filled with the, the Holy Spirit. We are baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that is affirmed in the sacrament of confirmation. But why is it that Catholics who are baptized, who are confirmed, do not actually live out that baptism uh, in their adult lives? Many of them live far uh, from, from, from Christ. No? And, and uh, they, they don't have the authenticity of the, of the Christian, Christian life. No? And so we talk of a renewed infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now that we are adults, now that we can understand, we're not a baby, we're not a young child, we can understand, we have our experience in the world, uh, we, we have known sin, or maybe we're still in sin when we experience uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit uh, in, through a uh, uh, initiations uh, course or process. You know. Then we we undergo that, that change, we undergo that that uh, conversion uh, and we are started off in that personal experience of, of God you know? that, that is what the infilling of the Holy Spirit is about and, and, and all uh, adults must have that uh, experience otherwise okay you, you're sacramentally baptized and confirmed but you're not actually living out the authentic Christian life and then with baptism in the Holy Spirit, we receive spiritual gifts. And, and there, that's very much understood as well. You, you ask uh, most priests how many spiritual gifts are there, and they'll say seven, and they'll be correct. It's the list in uh, Isaiah uh, 11, verses 2 to 3. But the spiritual gifts that we are concerned about is the list, the most basic list. It's the list of nine gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, the, the seven gifts are for personal sanctification. That's why when we're baptized, we are cleansed of original sin. We can grow. To, we have it in us, the gifts of the Spirit, by which we can grow uh, to be a holy person. But uh, the gifts of the Spirit uh, conferred when we have this adult infilling of the Holy Spirit are gifts for service. Each one is given a gift, and when you put all of those gifts together as one body, as one community, then that body, uh, the church, or individual bodies within the church are able to do its mission effectively because of those gifts. But many do not understand those gifts. Maybe that was the case for, for you and I as well. Uh, before we entered into the renewal and underwent uh, all of this uh, formation. So, with baptism in the Holy Spirit, you know, there's also the whole aspect of holiness. Not just a good person, but a holy person. There's that aspect of spiritual empowerment. I don't just trust in my own capabilities, my own resources, but I know that uh, in this uh, spiritual work, uh, I cannot prevail against the enemy who is powerful, but because of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment that is there, uh, we can prevail by the grace and mercy of God. And then we look to the uh, evangelization of the whole world. We are, uh, we are driven with desire to proclaim that salvation in Jesus 
to as many as, as we can. So there, there's what Pentecostals do. And because we Catholics are Pentecostals, then that's what we should do uh, as well. Now, in uh, among Catholics, this type of renewal happened through charismatic renewal. And I think that was in the mid-1970s where charismatic renewal came into the church. So the Catholic charismatic uh, renewal, the experience of baptism in the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts, including, including tongues. So renewal in uh, the Spirit. But uh, unfortunately, many still today in the institutional church do not accept or might even oppose some of these uh, practices, especially like tongues. Or do you hear about the prophecy uh, today in the church when, when prophets are so very, very needed because there's so much darkness and evil even within the church? Uh, prophets need to be heard to, be, to speak, but you don't see uh, so much those gifts being uh, exercised. So, P is for Pentecostal, the authentic faith, and to grow into the depth of that faith is to be Pentecostal. Okay, the fourth aspect, uh, T, and I'll give you a word that you probably might have heard of the first time, T, tub thumper for Christ. Tub thumper for Christ. Okay, I think it's the, oh, there you go. Tub thumper for uh, Christ. That, that's a new word. And, and uh, what is the definition of a tub thumper? Well, it is one who argues for or promotes something vigorously. It, it is uh, an advocate whose, whose speech is uh, passionate. Uh, it is a vociferous supporter or promoter of a cause. It is one who has great energy and determination. Now, at times, that word thumb, thumb, thumper uh, is used in a negative sense because you can also see that uh, you, you, you can really uh, turn off people when you become so, so aggressive, so vigorous, so, so passionate. But this describes, the good aspect of it, is it describes how we ought to be as evangelizers, as missionaries, as witnesses, as proclaimers of the word, as ambassadors of Christ. We need to be going all out. We need to be uh, brimming with, with passion. Uh, we, we need to you know, be, be ready to uh, overcome all obstacles that are there uh, in order to be, to be used by, by God, especially in an environment where there is so much resistance. Yeah. You know, don't just float into an environment and with very nice uh, soft words, suddenly everyone's converted. No, you need to assault the dominion of the, of the enemy. You need to go out there and face uh, uh, the, the evil spirits that are there and do this work. And they are aggressive. We need to be aggressive as well. That's being a tough thumper for, for Christ. So we're talking about conviction for, for mission. And again, we know that this is about the final instructions of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the Great Commission before he ascended into heaven. Uh, proclaim the gospel to all of creation. Make disciples of all the nations. It's a command. And we must obey. A disciple is someone who is obedient to, to, to Jesus. And this is what Jesus clearly told us, his final instructions. Oh. And we must obey, and especially because what is this all about? It is about souls. Jesus came into the world to save souls, but many souls are being lost today, and they need to desperately to hear the gospel. But how can they hear if there are no, uh, not that many laborers to bring in that harvest? So we need to be among those who, who go and try to do what we can, including online as we're doing today. This is about souls. This is about the dominion of God in this world. Unfortunately, today, again, in the church, uh, in the highest levels, we are told uh, not to proselytize. To proselytize is bad. How can it be bad? 
the meaning of proselytize is uh, making a convert. Of course, if you talk about financial inducements or, or forcing someone or threatening someone, uh, that, that's wrong. We're not talking about that. And that's not uh, actually the meaning of proselytism. Prosel proselytism is simply making converts. And that is the final instructions of Jesus. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In other words, make them Christians, make them Catholics. That's what needs to be done. So as uh, thump thumpers, we are engaged in spiritual war. And that's why we've talked so much about being uh, holy warriors. And this past few years and continuing, uh, this is the uh, call to us to be holy and to engage in spiritual warfare, warfare to be holy warriors. And talking about holiness, that brings us to the fifth aspect. Uh, uh, death, D-P-T-H, so now H, holiness. We always talk about holiness. And we need to always talk about holiness because it is something lacking in the lives of so many uh, Christians and Catholics today. To be holy is to be like Jesus. To be holy is to try to uh, be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. As Jesus himself told us in Matthew 5 verse 48. To be holy is to be set apart. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. Unfortunately, many Christians, many Catholics, they are in the world than of the world. In fact, in some places, they are even worse than the non-Catholics that are around them uh, in, in the world. But the, the, the Christian, the Christian faith is they call to be counter-cultural. Certainly not the culture of the age. Certainly not embracing the zeitgeist. Certainly not getting into modernism. But it is to be counter-cultural. And when we talk about being set apart, being called to holiness, then that means not the works of the flesh, but the works of the spirit, as we have seen. And never uh, getting into the essence that we also saw. Certainly not the culture of death. D-A-T-H. None of these things. Because our God is holy, and we are called to be holy, and we are doing divine uh, holy work and uh, we are destined for something great in Christ and finally we uh, make it to, to, to heaven. Holiness includes social justice issues by the way. So we are supposed to also work with uh, the poor. Okay, so the, the depth of uh, authentic Christianity, uh, discipleship, Evangelical, Pentecostal, Tub Thumper for Christ, and Holiness. So I think you will see from what I just uh, said, many flunk, F-L-U-N-K, the test of authenticity. And what many, all, all of us need is death, D-E-P-T-H of faith. Amen.